Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited to have Neville Medora, who's one of the titans of copywriting and direct response. Neville, thanks for being here. How's it going, Jeremy? Awesome to have you. And Neville's well known for his copywriting course with a K, which we're going to talk about, and for helping people kill their inner entrepreneur. And he owned a rave company and has never actually been to a rave. Yes. I'm excited. That we're going to talk about I've some... owned a lot of stuff. I owned a palm reading business at one point, and palm I don't even reading. believe in palm reading. Yeah. Like palm reading, like you read your palms. I had a business like that. Never never believed in palm reading. So you can do all sorts of stuff without being in the field. We'll talk about a little bit of everything, but a lot of copy. And I'm excited to hear your big lessons you learned and your journey success, what worked, what didn't work. I always like to include a fun fact. Fun fact about Neville is if you type in how to crash a party, <laughs> he comes up number one. Why is that? That's right. Uh, well, in the early days when I was in college, I had a mentor and he would I live in Austin, Texas, and there's all these like cool parties that would happen within like the rich people community over here. And I was so not plugged into that. I was a poor college kid. And so he would he would tell me about these and be like, you know what, you should just try to come, like see what happens. Don't pretend you know me, because I don't want to be like the guy who brought you, but like, you know, come. So he would tell me the location and I would go and crash these parties. And the funny thing is, I'm like a brown kid in crappy clothes that's showing up to a bunch of like tall white men with like nice clothes on and they all know each other. And I'm like this like kid like, uh, hi. Like, and so I totally like, I look like the help or something. I do not belong. <laughs> so I figured I have to like start making friends like now. And that's when I kind of learned how to like schmooze a room and like kind of work a room and all that stuff. And um, I started crashing parties and I used kind of the tips and stuff I learned over the years and I put them in a post. And then I think Neil Strauss, that eight time best selling author, he put it on his blog. He sent me all his books for it and I made a video and all that stuff. So somehow that has jostled up to the number one spot on Google for how to crush a party. It's pretty good. So and what are, good stuff. what's totally one or two of those things that you that you use to work the room and schmooze and fit in? <laughs> Well, uh, so first of all, you got to talk to people and, and I, I used to bring people with me sometimes I tell them and we go together, but then what happens is you stick together and you don't meet any new people. So one of the things I would do, cause I was kind of nervous back then, like I was shy is I would go to the bar line cause there's always free booze and there's always a line for the bar. And I would go up and like behind some guy and be like, we're in a line. I'd be like, man, you're wearing the monkey suit today. Uh, it was too hot for me to wear it. I live in Texas, so it's hot all the time. And, um, and so, because I was wearing crappy clothes, so I'd make an excuse for my clothes. And then I'd be like, man, I wish I, wish I had my booze right now. I should have brought a flask. And he would laugh, and then we'd chat, and he'd be like, oh, I'm Dave, I'm Neville, blah, blah, blah. And then Dave would see Bob, and Bob would come talk to Dave, and Dave would be like, oh, this is Neville. So this Bob guy thinks I belong here because he knows me. And, and it just kind of like builds to where you're like, Bob, what's up? Hey, Carol, how's it going? Has your husband arrived yet? Well, it's like, and now you like look like you belong. So the party planners see you and they're like, who is that kid? And then they're just like, well, he, he knows everyone, so he might belong. The other thing is, it, I won't spoil it, but look at how to crash a party and look at the last tip. It involves a wine glass, a cocktail napkin, a flask, and you will get in every single party every time. I love it. And that gets me now to, you know, what... What were you like as a kid? You, you've always had these entrepreneurial ventures. Well, it, I was, I was kind of shy and I'm Zoroastrian, which is a very small religious community. Uh, the religion part doesn't matter. It's just that we were a very tight community and there's a lot of business owners. And when I was, I don't know, like 15, 16, I don't remember the exact time, but I, I would ask my parents, I'd be like, how come these guys, there's a couple of like guys in the community that had like a lot of money and it was obvious. One guy had like a Lamborghini and one guy had just like a very large real estate company but was very humble. So opposite of the Lamborghini guy but like still very successful. And I asked my mom, like, what do they do? And so she would introduce me to them and, and, and I'd be like, she'd be like, Neville has questions about business. And I'd be like, um, w w what do you do? And one of the guys actually when I was I think 10th grade or something like that, 10th, 11th grade, he was like, you know, just come by. I'll hire you. Um, what do you want to get paid? And at this point, I didn't know what a job was. Like, I didn't understand if you get paid $1 an hour or $100 an hour. I had no clue. So he said, I'll pay you $10 an hour. Just come by and help me out with stuff. And he took me around and showed me, like, the CEO's kind of view of everything. And what was shocking about it was that this guy was no smarter than, like, anyone else I knew. In fact, like, it wasn't dumb. 
but he was he was just uh, hard working. That was the difference. Like he was a normal dude that just worked harder. He would go around to all his properties every single day, picking out tiny little details. This toilet's clogs. That there's a little scratch on the wall over there, and tell people about it. It was very like almost blue collar, and that's when I realized like, oh, like this guy's no different. He's just applying his his intellect in a different way than getting a job. Yeah. So seeing that, that firsthand really made an impact on you. Yeah, and then I saw other people. One guy owned a large computer store, uh, a computer heart store online. So he had a huge warehouse with like 60 people working there. And he gave me a graphics card, and I was super into computers at the time. And he's like, here, just take this. I was like, this isn't even out yet. I he's like, I know. So go sell it on eBay and see what you can get for it. And, and that was kind of like a lesson. So I was lucky in that I had some family friends that could kind of show me around. Yeah. That was cool. And so from there, I realized like I wanted to be a doctor originally, and I was just like, why to be a doctor? You got to like be cooped up all day. You got to do what everyone else says. And you got to do the same thing your whole goddamn life. Um, with uh, the entrepreneurial path, I might bomb, but actually I might, you know, exceed my expectations as a doctor being the, the limit. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got interested in entrepreneurship. I sold CDs and stuff in middle school and like did a little couple money hustles here and there, but nothing really big. Yeah, and so what did the early days look like in your career? Because I know from re reading your stuff, you, you say, you know, I never really had a job. So you always had this entrepreneurial, these ventures going on. Yeah, so that started kind of like in high school. I was a, like kind of a computer geek, and I wasn't like some crazy programmer or anything. But I could build a basic web page back when it wasn't very common. I could use Photoshop. I knew how to use the internet. I was Cisco certified, which meant I really knew how to use the internet pretty well. Um, and, and hack into routers and all sorts of crazy stuff, which we never use for bad things, just for fun. And, and sure enough, what would happen was people would be like, oh, I, I need a website for my business. Can you make it? It would be like a family friend. And I'd be like, uh, yeah, I'll help you. And then they're like, what do we pay you? And I was like, I don't know, like $100? Like, I had no idea like, how that worked. So they, they, would, they would pay me for stuff. And then like, I, I had this thing called Neville's Cool Car Archive. I would download pictures of cool cars, like wallpapers back in the day and Photoshop the backgrounds out so it was just a car with black around it. And it looked really cool, or so 16-year-old me thought. And I'd put those on a, a website, and that started getting like a lot of traffic, but there's no way to monetize back then. This was like pre-Google AdWords. I think I put some banners up and made like 70 cents or something, like a joke, right? And so uh, I couldn't even redeem it because it was so small. And so anyways, so I did stuff like that all the time. And somewhere around 11th or 12th grade, I thought like, you know, e-commerce is like a big buzzword. Like back then it was in the bubble days. And I was like, maybe I should start some sort of e-commerce business. So I, I literally took a sheet of paper out and like, you know, like a pen and my tiny handwriting wrote down 300 products that I could possibly sell. So I was like, uh, I looked around the room. I was like, light fixtures, picture frames, mirrors, lamps, microphones, computers. And I kind of scratched out things I didn't think I could sell. or So like furniture. I didn't know anything about furniture. I didn't have any money. So I didn't think I could buy furniture. So that was out. And it was actually a suggestion from my brother. He said rave products. So I went on like Alta Vista or whatever the search engine was back then and searched for, uh, you know, rave stores. And there was like only two websites that looked legit. The rest sucked and were horrible. And I was like, I can make a better looking website than that. Not that that matters, but back then I thought better looking meant better website. So I did. And then I called up one of the places that looked legit. And I said, hey, uh, I had this company called houseofrave.com. I just made up some name. I thought House of Rave was really clever. Sounds good. It just, I just took the products from their website and posted it up. Like, I don't know if this is illegal or not. And I was like, I want to start selling stuff. And I was going to sell it myself, but I see you already sell. So this way, if someone buys from me, you'll always get a cut of it. And I told him this Wrigley's gum thing I picked up from Warren Buffett. He says, if you buy Big Red or Spearmint gum or, or whatever brand there is, Wrigley's always gets a cut because they own all of them, right? Or they're invested in all of them. So I told them that example and they were like, okay, that sounds cool. And so back then that was kind of like an innovative thing. Now it's just called drop shipping. It's a pretty simple thing. And the model is kind of skewed now. Like I probably wouldn't be able to start it today, but uh, because of Amazon and whatnot. So that's how I got my first start to making a real business. And within like a few weeks of me putting up that website, someone 47 or so dollars worth of stuff off the website. And How did they find to, it? Just, just searching? Don't know. I, I mean, it was, it was clearly from a search engine or something, but I don't really know how they found it. You know, like at the time I was just like, this is an experiment. It wasn't like really, no one's really going to buy this crap. I mean, I, I never, a million years thought anyone's going to buy anything. 
And so they did. And, um, and from there, I started getting more and more orders. I started promoting in forums and I started learning SEO and things like that. Um, how to make sure I get to the top of the search engines uh, over my suppliers. And that's how House of Rave started. And despite like gross neglect from that business, people kept ordering. And that's why I was like, maybe there's something here. And so that helped pay for my college. That supported me after I graduated from college, all sorts of things. So how did you get interested in copy? Copy was, it was actually while I was running, uh, it was maybe like 26, 27. I was living downtown and uh, Noah Kagan, he was like number 30 at Facebook and stuff, started a little AppSumo thing. He started on the side, just a tiny little thing. And he kind of started building it off my couch. And around that time, I started studying this thing, I started studying marketing in general, not just copy, but everything. And I stumbled upon copywriting, which is uh, with, with a C, which is copywriting where you, you, take, you change the words around on this page and it will better communicate what you're trying to sell or convert higher. Meaning if, one, if 100 people come to your website and one person buys every single day, one out of 100 is 1% conversion rate, right? Simple math. Now, what if 10 people bought? Now that's a 10% conversion rate. And with copywriting, if you just change up the words and the layout a little, you can completely go from one sale a day to 10 sales a day, effectively, you know, 10 X in your business or something like that, or, or even more if they all buy other stuff too. So I was like, well, this is a fascinating thing. And it's, it, it appealed to like the lazy side of my mind, right? I was just like, you barely have to do anything. You make more money. So I tried a very well copywritten email with House of Rave. I had 7,500 people on the newsletter. And I used to send out a newsletter all the time. It made zero sales, like literally maybe two sales sometimes, but I put a coupon and then it cost 80 bucks a month to just host the damn list. So I would go negative every month by sending out emails. I just thought that's how it was, like you're promoting your brand or whatever. I sent out a properly copywritten email with my friend Ryan Levesque. He helped me out. And um, it made 120 orders within the first two hours wow. versus zero and losing money on each one. So I made a tremendous amount of money that day. I sold out of the inventory. And I, that, from that day on, I was convinced that like, okay, like th maybe there's something here. And then I did it again and again and again. And it was around that time that Noah was sending out emails to 50,000 people on AppSumo. And he would have a very simple page, just like, you know, buy this deal from grasshopper.com. And I was like, you know, your emails suck. Like, let me try rewriting one of them. So, you know, on the couch one day, I just quickly rewrote one, sent it over to him. And we were both hesitant, or he was very hesitant to put it out. Um, I didn't have any skin in the game, so I didn't give a shit, right? But he was like, oh, this is too long and blah, blah. I was like, dude, trust me, trust me. Just, just what did try. you put in that email that he was hesitant that actually worked? So, so, so what he was hesitant about was it was an email. It was called Kernest, okay? So if you go on Google... Uh, you can type in AppSumo Kernest, K-E-R-N-E-S-T. And what it was was a font matching service. And I didn't, I, I didn't know what this was, but as a good copywriter, it doesn't matter. You, you can figure out what it is pretty quick, right? So what it was was he was sending out a deal to designers, graphics designers, and they were obsessive about fonts usually. Like the reason sometimes web pages look really good is their font combinations go together. And there is a bit of a science that goes behind it. Steve Jobs was a huge font fanatic. He talks about it in all the books and interviews yeah. he does, fonts. And, and when you look at the Mac screen, you're just like, oh, it's quite nice. You don't know why, but there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And so I, I put that in my register, right? And then I said, you know what? Most people, of this 50,000 he's sending to at the moment, most people are not going to be interested in a font pairing service. Like that's way super uber graphics nerds, right? So I said, so the first part of the email said, if I whisper the words Garamond into your ear and you, get a, and you don't get a boner, this is not for you. <laughs> that was like the opening sentence. So already far departure. Or, Unless it's a female designer, in which case it could be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or like, you know, if you don't get chills down your spine when I say Verdana or, you know, like these common fonts that people would know. Um, and, and already, like even non-font designers were like, what is this? <laughs> like they were reading it, right? And they all loved it. But, but for the graphics designers, what I showed was, one, I disqualified everyone else. I'll save you your time if you don't want to read this. Dude. The second thing I said, I told the whole Steve Jobs bit, you know, why, why Steve Jobs loved fonts so much and how he made products successful because of fonts. Not because of fonts, but that added to it, right? For sure. Then I told graphics designers, 
here's the way to delight your customers, right? And how much time they spend, like, I, and I know designers, they do spend a lot of time matching fonts. There's a professional font designer who goes through and matches three fonts every month and sends it to you. That's it, that's all you get. Um, but I explained why it'll help their projects and why that little investment of $110 or so for a full year of this would go a long, 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 long way, right? So once I explained that, by the end, these designers were like, yeah, that makes sense. I would totally buy this. Whereas if, I just, if we just said like, font matching service, buy. You know, maybe a small portion of people would buy, but like they don't know, you haven't massaged them into why. Mm -hmm. Like what's the purpose, right? So what is, so, you know, for people listening to this. Question, but that's no, no, for that's people listening to, to this, Neville, you know, mm. like. Then I started doing AppSumo emails like over and over and over again. And then uh, during the big growth phase of AppSumo, those emails were like very crucial in terms of keeping people engaged. Like people would say like, I wake up in the morning and take a dump and I go straight to my phone to read your emails. <laughs> like, I mean, they were addicted to these things. People loved them. So what was and, it? That, and from there I became known as a copywriter. So the question was, what was, and I think people in general about copywriting, what was Noah so hesitant about? What were the things that the same reason probably people listen to It was long. It was long. And it looked so pretty whenever he had the original email, right? It, it was like a nice template and said AppSumo and it had the logo and then it had like the subtitle of what the yeah, AppSumo, it's like the Groupon for nerds or whatever. Like, and it was, there was all these like things around it and a nice border, you know? And the way I sent it out was plain text. Like I think there was one image on the whole thing, if any, and then a giant buy now button, like, like a link with all text. And it was just such a departure from what most companies do that most people are like, what are you insane? You can't do that. In fact, the, uh, the reverse is true. And, and so I've, had I've been fortunate to have like, friends that own a lot of companies. And one of my friends owns a very large optimization company. And they've spent literally, I mean, maybe $50 million plus optimizing stuff. And what they found is like the shitty pages that sometimes even look broken, like sometimes stuff is out of place and everything. Those are the pages that convert the highest every single time. Yeah. And it's just like, what the hell is going on over here? And these guys are obsessed with conversions, okay? And it, it is the shitty pages that do the best. Yeah. And the reason is, there's no distraction. There's no, there's no, there's no you know, tinsel to distract you and shiny pretty things. It's literally just like, here's what it is. So that's why I've had blog posts that have converted higher than sales pages because it's just good information. They need to know why. It doesn't matter how it looks. It just doesn't matter how it conveys the information. And All you're doing whenever you have a page is conveying information, whether it be video, audio, text, the look of the page, a, a red button, a blue button, doesn't matter. You're conveying information. And so, so long as you do that in the most efficient way and they trust you, um, you're good. What was it about the House of Rave email that was so successful? Because you said before it you had zero sales. Yeah, so before, and uh, I think you can, can we share screens on this? Does that, does that, uh, does that happen? It won't let us, no. Okay, if it won't let us share screens, I'll, I'll tell you. If you, if you type in uh, the House of Rave Quick Sell Experiment on, uh, or Nevblog House of Rave Quick Sell Experiment, somewhere on that, you can download like the PDF or there's a post or you'll be able to find it somewhere. And it shows my emails from House of Rave before, and they were very long. They had lots of pictures, which I personally took all the pictures myself. A lot of click here buttons. It was very geared towards getting people to click. And you know what? People clicked. People really did click. I had like 30, 40% people clicking, which is very high. However, no one bought anything. That was the problem. I didn't give a shit if people clicked, if just like a few people bought. Like I'd be more happy with that. So what happened was it was just like, here, here was the theory. It was just like, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this. Like as soon as you throw it in your face, buy this, buy this, buy this. That was what I was doing to people, just throwing it at them. And if someone happened to be interested at the, of a random product at that time, maybe they'd buy, maybe they wouldn't, I don't know. Like there was no real, it was just like buy, buy, buy. Instead with the email, I said, I told a whole story around it. And I was like, hey, I screwed up. I sent a bunch of finger lights to uh, my parents' house, not the warehouse. And we're overloaded over there, so I'm going to send out these uh, finger lights at a crazy price. Now, the crazy price I'd done before. I'd actually sold them at a crazy price before. Um, 
and they didn't really sell all that well and I didn't make much profit. But I told a story how there's only 500. On a normal day, I sell 50 of these things a day. So it, with this email and this price, these probably aren't gonna last long. So there was kind of like an element of urgency in there, which was mm -hmm. true. Uh, the first 50 orders sold out all the inventory. And so there was all these other elements and it was all text. Uh, there's no, not a single image in the whole thing. It's just one link or maybe two links, but one link, uh, one main link to buy. And so it told a great story, it's properly copywritten. All the elements, it was written in proper ADA format for the first time instead of just like, buy, buy, buy. It explains why they should buy. And here's the kicker. It also explained, there's, there's little finger lights, these little things that go in your fingers. And um, I explained to them, I was like, you know what? Most people think these are for 16 year olds going to a rave. That's not true. 90% of the people that buy these are not ravers. They're not 16. They're actually 35 year old mothers. Mothers use them to give, put on their children's finger for when they go to bed at night. Some kids are scared of monsters. Hmm. They can look under the bed with a little light. This is true. These are all real things people buy. Plumbers use them because like, they're all in like, weird ass places and they need something to point. And these are just an ideal, cheap, little disposable thing. There was autistic kids that when you wave them, in the, they wave them in their face and they calm down. I thought that was like a weird kind of interesting thing. There was all these other reasons. Uh, MTV used them on like laser guns for one of their shows. I mean, there's all these crazy uses for them. Halloween costumes, you name it. So I listed all those. Now, when I listed all those, it got people's minds jogging like, oh, I could use that for Nicholas's science project. Oh, Halloween's coming up. I can use it for this thing, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I do this. I, I go camping all the time. I can use one of those, blah, blah, blah. And so then people were just like, oh, there's more uses for this. So then instead of like 16-year-old ravers, which is a tiny little community, tiny little community, that, that hole was widened and that net was cast much larger. Now people were interested. So people bought a lot of them. Yeah. So by yeah. telling that story, people really – you just expanded that, you know, basically the realm that people can think and, and purchase for themselves. Well, what happened even with the Kernis deal with the font matching, even non-designers, like not people who just built web pages for their company or whatever, they always had trouble designing with fonts because they weren't designers. So they're like, oh, this is the perfect answer to my solution. I didn't even intend this, but they were just like, well, I suck at pairing the fonts. So if I just buy this, this, this guy will, Kernis will tell me. And so a lot of those people bought also. Um, and so I cast the net wider than just simply, you know, small time gra or, or very hardcore graphics designers. Yeah. I did that uh, certainly, but it happened. Yeah. What I really want to know now, but one of the biggest things is how did you come up with copywriting course with a K? And I want to know what, what gets your creative juices flowing because you say this stuff like it comes natural, but for everyone, it doesn't come natural. So tell me why a K, how'd you come up with it? You really want to know the secret, the real secret, why copy is spelled with a K? Of course. Because I wanted to do it a copywriting course and copywritingcourse.com was taken. So I was like, fuck it, I'll just do it with K's. <laughs> yeah, like, but you know what? I'll have to push back on you because I would have been, most people may be like, well, co maybe I'll do copywriting, you know, book or copyright, you know, they'll add a word. Well, here's what happened. It just kind of, it was one of those things, like people ask AppSumo, about AppSumo and the truth was like, there was a bunch of names and that was just one of them. Like it's not like that great of a story. Copywriting, I was just like, well, it'd be funny if it was with K's, copywriting course. And then I remember thinking like, but why would I call it with copywriting course with K's? That's stupid. But then I just thought in my head, the stuff I'm teaching here is a little bit different. It's the same basic principles, but it's taught in a different way. I'm a younger guy than a lot of the bigger, uh, more established people. This course is very short. It's quick. It's got curse words in it. Um, it's different. Copywriting is different. And so even on the sales page for like copywriting course, it's, it's a little different now. But it said, damn, this is a copywriting course and already we've misspelled the name, you know? But why? It doesn't matter. Here's why, blah, blah, blah. And it's talked about conversion for copywriting. It, it doesn't really matter about your grammar, you know? If you, if you make an ellipse, which is three dots, you know, three little periods, if you make that with four dots, who cares? The, the grammar is out the window in this case. So long as people get it and they recognize and they buy, your, your job is done, right? Yeah. And so that's why I went copyright with a K. And then it kind of like turned into this like great thing. I was just like, if I ever do a copywriting conference, it'll be copywriting conference. If I do a copywriting club, I'll call it the copywriting course club and say KKK. And I'll have like on the I guess I won't be going to that. My brown ass going, join the KKK. Right. And like, I remember thinking that even back then, like there's so much I could do with this funny name. 
And it, it was just one of those happy things, that happy accidents that happened. Yeah. So how do you? And get, so then, go ahead. It, it, it just it just naturally occurred like that. Yeah. So how did you get your how do you get your creative juices flowing? Because yes, that happened. Yes, you thought copywriting with a K, but you know, like one of your emails is I remember Mr. Moneybags and Mr. Yeah. Suckington or something. I what was it? What Mr. was it? Mr. Sucky Writington or something. Right. Yeah. I, so well, I mean, I was just trying to find a character that's just like I want to make them entertaining for people, right? Like if 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 I just said like imagine uh Company A did this and Company B did that. It, it's like, okay, great. But if you call him Mr. Moneybags, that's a very visual picture of like this guy walking around with like money, right? And then Mr. McSucky Writington. It's less work for your brain to identify that Mr. McSucky Writington is, is the guy who can't write, right? right? Whereas if I say Company B, what does that mean? I don't know. And then I have to reference in my brain like, Wait, company B is the one that writes bad? And now like, my brain has gone off on this tangent and I don't remember it. So if I just say Mr. McSucky Writington is trying to write an email to Mr. Moneybags, already you know that like, okay, this guy's bad at writing and he's not going to get the, the sale, right? It's pretty obvious. So that was the reasoning behind that. And, and is that creative? I don't know. I just thought it was funny. Like I remember when I was writing it, I was kind of laughing and I was, I was like... This is so stupid. <laughs> like, but the, the thing is people really identify with that stuff. It's just, it's, it's funny. It makes them laugh. And if you think my job is as a copywriter or kind of what I do now is like to teach. And, and I'm sure in, in school at some point, everyone here has had good teachers and then they've had like 90% were just like pretty average, right? Um, but the good teachers, the reason they probably stood out was because they tried, they put some theatrics on, they really they brought it every time they went to class, right? And so I had a history teacher who was massively boring. And then I also had another history teacher in high school who was massively interesting and everyone loved his class even though the, the, the subject was like history too. You know, it's like a really boring subject, but he made it interesting. He made it fun for us. He made it relatable, you know? Whereas the other guy was just like, John Cornwall was born in 19. It's like, you know, he's not really bringing it. So it's my job to make it interesting. So if I had to say Mr. McSucky Writington instead of, you know, person A, I'd do that. Yeah. I mean, if someone says to you, you know, Neville, I'm just not creative. I don't know if I can come up with, with something like that. What do you tell them? How do you get their, get them well, stimulated? Like when I write it, I don't mean to be creative. It's just, it's just kind of like you write several versions of it and something sticks, right? right. So if you write it several times, like your first headline, I write like four to 20 headlines and I just keep spouting them out. And then I'll ask someone else to look at them and they'll be like, eh, ooh, that's, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I would totally read that article. And if someone else says the same thing, you're just like, okay, something's there. Uh, I mean, something's there. And so it's just iteration. It's yes. not creative necessarily. That's helpful. Yeah. That's helpful because they may think, oh, Neville's got it on the first try. He just wrote Mr. Moneybags. And that may have been your 10th iteration of that first the thing. The result of all that kind of stuff, right? right. You don't see the, 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 it took me a couple of days to write that. Or then like I right. went back you know, through the autoresponder and change it up later. Um, like it's like when you put out your show, people think like everything just goes swimmingly. What people may not realize is that we actually had to cut at some point to like make sure the audio went right. And then when I first got on, there's all sorts of audio issues and I couldn't see you and blah, blah, blah. They don't see all that. All they see is like, wow, Jeremy puts out a perfect podcast every time, you know, or a perfect video every time. They I don't know only if they say that, but, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. They only see the end results. They, they never see all the creative uh, uh, stuff behind the scenes. Right. So. It's not creativity. It's just it's just trying again yeah. and again. No, that's helpful. So, Neville, what is the part of the copywriting course that people struggle the most with? The part of the copywriting course that people struggle the most yeah. with? Kind of made it to where the people – you mean copywriting in general? Yeah, copywriting struggle. in general or – yeah. Okay, so what happens is – and, and I, I put out a product just because of this recently. And I've seen it a million times. They'll go through the copywriting course or something that I've, I've written. But then they'll, they'll, they'll just sit down and be like, okay, now what do I write? And so if they actually studied it properly, they'll know how to go through all this. But people who just kind of vaguely skim it or something like that um, or know a little bit about copyright will be like, well, I sit down and I don't know what to write. And so that's the biggest problem. And the reason is they don't have a framework. 
I mean, every single time I write something, I literally like if you, in the copywriting course, you see me actually live doing this. And this is the part that people like really, really love for some reason. I go in Google Docs. I write everything in Google Docs. I don't use Word anymore. It's garbage. And then, uh, and then I just make a table and I write out attention, interest, desire, action, ADA. I, I keep using that formula. Since the day I learned it, I've been using it. I've tried to stray from it and just haven't worked as well. So I use that. And in the attention section, I know what will get people's attention on a certain subject, right? So for copywriting, what's going to get their attention more? Saying, um, learn how to write copy. Okay, like that's okay. Or learn how this page went from one sale a day to 200 sales a day with only one hour of work. I, I was making stuff up. But like obviously that's going to be a little more uh, attention grabbing, right? So I would start off with some sort of attention grabbing thing that's relevant. I can't just say like squirrel, squirrel uh, skiing behind a boat or something like that. It has to be relevant. Right. You get their attention. That's just scammy and stupid. So and it doesn't work in the long run, by the way. Short term it does, long run no. Uh, so what happens is I do that, and then I come up with all the bullet points for the interest part. So if you're trying to learn about copy, say like if you ever write emails, you can double the conversions of whatever you do, including for salespeople. Or I'll write an interesting fact or kind of testimonial like thing that uh, salespeople who have taken the copywriting course have seen up to 3x their income within like after taking this two-hour course. It's ridiculous sometimes because they know they know the theories behind cold emailing better now that they've taken the course. And so I'll write all those bullet points out and then I'll go to the desire section and, and write that out. And then the action section say, here's how you buy, here's what you get, here's how much it costs, that kind of stuff. And already I have like this, and you'll see this in the copywriting course, when you follow this formula, within like a minute, you've already got like 80% of the sales letter written. Now, it's not long, it's not great yet, and you gotta tie it together and stuff, mm -hmm. but you've pretty much got it all done uh, with, with just like a minute of work. I did this in, in the AppSumo, if you type in AppSumo copywriting checklist, uh, copywriting with a K, copywriting checklist Neville or something like that. AppSumo Neville checklist, one of those keywords. You'll find it, there's like a $10 product I made that's just a PDF for someone who's like, ugh, I've got a deadline at 3 p.m. and uh, I don't know, and they're all gonna review my stuff and I don't know what to write. And the guy's like banging his head against the wall, what would I write? I made a checklist for those people that basically you read it, go through it, and follow along, and by the end you'll have like 80% of like a properly uh, psychologically driven sales letter. And so there's there's formulas to it. That's the trick. Yeah. Like it's a formula. And now you can I don't like those emails that like follow an exact formula, just pop in the name because that eliminates a lot of the, the cool stuff about it. But, um, but it is a formula. It's a framework. Like, yeah, it's a framework, exactly. So what, uh, you know, one of the questions I was gonna ask you, Neville, is one of your most successful campaigns and why it was so effective. Can you talk about maybe the framework a little bit with one of the most successful campaigns you had? Yeah, some of them some of them go on a hunch, but the most successful ones are all tested. And and uh, so I'll talk about AppSumo because that's just an easily relatable example, and it's got such a big audience that we can those numbers are very statistically valid. Um, so with AppSumo, one of the things I did was uh, we did this thing called the Sumo Business Blueprint, and that was like this breakaway. I mean, unbelievably well done. Like it just did really really well. And what we noticed was there was already interest in it. The breakaway products are the one that there's already interest in, okay? It's not some new thing out of total left field. I've done some really left field products. I did like how entrepreneurs can lose weight or something like that because I went through this period where I learned how to eat better. I thought like, man, this might be the biggest thing on there. It totally flopped. It, just, it, it was just too left field. People weren't asking for it. So the way to get money is like go to the people that are already handing you money. So what happened is Noah <clears> – <throat> He wrote a post on the, the, the four hour work week, that blog by Tim Ferriss, called uh, How to Make Your First Million Dollar Business This Weekend uh, Hint Chihuahuas. Like, it's a funny title or something like that. And that post just blew the hell up. Like, the comments went bananas on it. And people loved it. It's getting like the most shares on his blog, all that kind of stuff. And so I saw this and I was just like, it was good stuff. It was totally like unique ways to validate a business. And it was like, no one was really spouting these kinds of things. And so I was like, no, like, dude, like, we got to make a product out of this. And he didn't have the time. And I was just like, well, I can maybe formulate something and we'll brand it as AppSumo. 
And so already people were asking in the comments the exact questions. How do I find my idea? How do I do this? Blah, blah, blah. So I basically copied that post, the, the overall structure of it. It was like a three-step thing. It's like how to find ideas, how to validate them, and then how to implement them really quick to see if they work and get your first dollar from it. Uh, so I, I took that and made it into a video course. And when we sent that out, I did a couple of surveys and stuff. And I was like, what do you need help with the most? And most people were like, I need an idea. How do I find an idea? Like that kind of stuff. So instantly I knew that that kind of language that people were spouting, I need to find an idea. I need to use that over and over and over in the sales pitch, right? How do I find an idea? I need to find an idea. I need to find an idea in quotes, you know? And people, people are already thinking about that, so they instantly see, I need to find an idea, and they're like, oh, what's that again? The how to lose weight for entrepreneurs, they're just like, eh, whatever. I need to find an idea. Ooh, oh, oh yeah, 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 that's good. So we already kind of like validated this, but meaning like people already like showed that people would pay for it, that people were already kind of like paying attention to that post. And then I, we mentioned that we're going to do a video course. So that post shows everything. And we told people like, go read this for free. If you want it for free, go for it. It tells you all the information right here, free, yours to have. But if you want to see us doing it step by step and build a real goddamn business in real time in front of you, then you got to buy the course, right? So we really went all the way with the course with this one. And so that course, because it was like pre-validated almost and people were already in a frenzy about it, when we launched it, it just went crazy. Yeah. It went bananas. It sold a lot of copies. And it was kind of obvious. Like we knew that course would do well. We didn't know how well, but we already knew it would do well just based on the general interest yeah. around it. Yeah, but there's things you did in the copy specifically to made it, made it you know, do even better. You, know, you used the language of the people um, that were talking. What else did you do in that email? Oh, well, using the language is really interesting. And then also showing kind of what they're getting, right? And so, uh, like, if they knew what the information, the general information was, was free, we already gave it out, you know? I also put everyone on an autoresponder list. That was a big thing I did. That was the first time I ever did that, and it worked like crazy. I've always done it since. So I said, if you want to know when the course is going live, enter your email here. Bam. Those people are really likely to buy because they're, like, interested enough to put their email. Then... We sent them a couple emails about how to kill your entrepreneur. So if you, I think if you go to the sumobusinessblueprint.com still, you can still sign up to that autoresponder. And it's actually really good. And it shows like, here's, here's how to validate a business. Here's why most people don't do it. Here's why people fail. Here's what a entrepreneur does. A entrepreneur says, let me get an LLC. Let me buy business cards. Let me get shirts that say my- I my, remember my that business. video. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very comical and, um, and, and it really hit people in the gut thinking like, oh my God, I totally do this. Like anytime, anytime I hear about a company or think of a business idea, I'm like registering the domain name and stuff before I even think, is it a valid idea? Um, which I'm guilty of too sometimes. But like they do all these things like spend money, 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 money before they prove anyone's going to give them a damn dollar. And so we sent out some emails on exactly how to do that, what to avoid, what to do. So already they were paying attention to these emails. And they were very excited to them, buy them. So when we released the course, that small core group of people was definitely going to buy, mm -hmm. totally going to buy. And, and sure enough, they did. So we have a big list on AppSumo, but we kind of segmented them down, like you know, the, the funnel, I guess, if you call it, um, to the smaller list of people that were super interested enough to sign up their email and say, hey, we want to hear from you about this. And those people bought like, like crazy. The conversion rate was crazy high because yeah. they were totally warm. And Neville, the other question I had was, you know, when you were talking about the ADA, the format, mm -hmm. you know, there was a time you said you strayed from that. Tell me that why you strayed at that time. Because people are going to feel like, oh, I got this. What's well, that? And it beat, yeah, I didn't like that the formula worked so well that it beat me. I thought I'm creative. I can get away from this. Right. So I would all willy-nilly like I used to write blog posts and stuff like that. And, and, and truthfully... That was okay. I'm not like saying anything against it, but whenever I did the ADA formula, every goddamn time it would win, like by a significant degree. I'm making ghetto tea. I have a tea bag in here and a glass of water. So, <laughs> um, so what was what was the one where you where you, it killed your you know the ADA killed your other one that you thought you were so creative and you did such a great job? We split tested copy before. Uh, specific, like even the copywriting course, um, 
at the time, well, at that time I was already so like ingrained with Ada that it didn't really matter. But some of the earlier AppSumo ones, I would try to like put like a buy button like in the middle or make them buy it then. But it it always worked better when you built up and then at the very end say, here's where you buy it. Like that just that that for I always like to zig when people zag, you know, like that kind of mentality, which is kind of stupid sometimes. But sometimes whenever things just work, it's just like <laughs> you can just follow it. <laughs> you just do what they did. Right. So for people taking notes, just say one more time ADA, what that stands for. ADA is a- attention, interest, desire, and action. Yeah. And you can apply this to every area of your life, whether it be talking with your spouse, your child on why not to like his room or why to clean his room. Um, let me give you an example. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly describe it and then I'll give you a real life example. If I say, so what you do is attention, you grab their attention. I is interest. You give them interesting facts or reasons that they should buy or interesting facts about the product. Then you make them desire it saying, here's what it could do for you or Bob used it and here's what happened for him. And then action, meaning they take action. Like, so press buy to buy now and within 24 hours you'll receive your new blah, blah, blah. You know, tell them what's going to ha- happen what the refund policy is, exactly what's gonna happen. You put, you buy from PayPal and it goes straight to your inbox or you get a physical product within two days. What is, what is the thing that is going to happen when they buy? You're basically solving all their objections like, uh, can I trust this guy? Do I get my money back if I don't like it? What exactly am I getting? That's where you solve all your stuff. Mm-hmm. Let, me, let me demonstrate this. Um, so, so uh, well, I've got a glass of water here so I'm gonna to try to use this. So I'm gonna say, use, hey, one of your, use one of your products. Uh, I don't have. I want to use a glass of water just because okay. it's easier. I'm gonna do this. Your so I'm gonna nav say, box. I'm gonna try to get you. I'm gonna try to get you to uh, to drink more water. Okay. Now I could just say, "Hey, you should drink more water." Okay. Uh, yeah. Obviously, not very convincing. How about this? Uh, do you work out at all? Yeah. You work out how many times a week? Twice. Twice a week. And what's your goal on that to kind of get a little bit bigger, stay in shape? You know? Yeah, just stay in shape, cardio. Usually it involves a ball like basketball or something like that. Okay, cool. Well, I suppose you want a result out of your workout, right? So here's a funny thing. Whenever people lift weights and do cardio or anything like that, one of the biggest changes to your muscles is, is uh, you know how they say water weight? A lot of people who take creatine and stuff have water weight in their muscles. What happens is whenever you do excessive work on, your, on a muscle, it tears. And then what goes in is protein and water goes in and kind of repairs it. Your body's like 70% water, something like that. You're not, you know about all this stuff. But it goes and repairs the muscle, okay? So whenever bodybuilders, they, you probably see them in the gym, sometimes those big meatheads, and they've got those comically large like jugs. That you, it looks like one of those big Ozarka upside down bottles they have at a water cooler, but it's got a handle on it. It's like a it. mini keg, sort of, yeah. Like, what the hell are they doing? It's, it's almost like ludicrous that they're carrying around like a gallon of water. Why are they doing that? Why is it every big guy has a big goddamn gallon of water? Because he has to repair his muscles because he's got so many muscles to repair. That's why he's drinking so much water. So if you drink a lot of water whenever you work out, you get 30% more gains than if you drink the typical eight eight glasses a day or whatever that is, which is not that much. So if you drink more water, you get more gains for the same workout. Meaning if you go to the gym twice a week and lift weights, you'll grow 30% faster with the same exact routine by drinking an extra glass of water at the gym. Now, okay, done. Done with the spiel. I honestly don't know if that's true. I just made that shit up. <laughs> it sounded good. I know. I was like, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. It sounds right. Like uh, now you're the you're the doctor, so I I don't, I don't know, but um, it might be true. Who who knows? But what did I do there? I got your attention that you work out, so now you're kind of like interested in it. I gave you all these interesting facts about how water repairs muscles, right? And then I showed that like kind of like the big meathead guys do it. And then I said, if you just drink one more glass of water at the gym, you'll get 30% more gains for the same workout, like free, free, free muscle. Great. Awesome. Right. That's the reason you're there. And then at the end, I just said, you know, drink more water. Now, if that were all true and I left you there, the next time you go to the gym, you'd probably one, start noticing all the meatheads with the giant jugs of water. And then two, you'd probably be like, I'll get some extra sips from the water fountain or carry around a bottle. And I would have totally convinced you to drink more water, right? Instead of like, yo, you're going to drink more water. 
So that was the ADA formula in action on something that's totally outside of marketing and selling anything, right? Just trying to convince you of something. Now you can apply this to your wife, your kids, anyone. Like it, it, it works really well in personal and business. It's, it's a very, very powerful formula. You know, Neville, I think I came across a web page the other day with someone who used your formula, probably one of your students. I'm reading through and I get to the end. Obviously it was good copy because I'm – I got to the end of the page and they had a buy button at the bottom and I'm like thinking why I scroll up to the top I'm like wait they didn't put a buy button anywhere it was really long form they didn't put a buy button anywhere on the page but all the way at the bottom and I'm thinking huh I wonder why they didn't put it in the beginning or the middle just like what you said and and I used to do it I used to think the more buy buttons the better right like there's more places they can click. But that's really? not how a sale occurs. People don't just randomly click and they're like, oh, I hit the shopping cart, I better just check <laughs> out. But like, that's not how it happens. Um, people, like, like the iPhone, you can't buy it sometimes because it's out, but people will go through great lengths to get it. So you have to make people want what you have to sell yeah. before the, the buy button doesn't matter. People, a lot of newbies are just like, what's the best color buy button to use? It's like I've used PayPal buttons, regular ass PayPal buttons in a blog post with no images and done really well. I've also used giant buy buttons but done a poor job explaining why they should buy it yeah. and that does really poorly. The buy button isn't the thing. It's how I explain it to you, right? How I, how I get you, massage you into that, show you why you need it, show the benefit. And then I have to get your mind to go, Oh, that would be that would that would really help this business or whatever purpose I'm trying to do. And so that's what it is. That's why they talk about why you get it, what you get, who's done it before, the results they've got before, uh, the the benefits you're going to see, the downsides of it, what what's it going to cost you, blah blah blah. Before they show you just like buy 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 buy. It doesn't work like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I was I even you scroll up landing page. It'll usually have it at the bottom or at least. You gotta scroll down quite a bit. To right. Finally find it. Yeah. Yeah. The light bulb went on. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. I was like, why'd they do that? Um, so, also, the other question is I wanna know some of your favorite headlines that have worked for you. I don't really have any favorite headlines. I, you know, someone else asked, the, asked me that the other day. Some like kind of scammy guy I didn't really like. And there's a lot of these scammy internet marketer pieces of crap out there. And I they mean, said. You were, let me rephrase. One that you're most proud that you thought of. Uh, no, I, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter because it's, it's such a, I, I, ne I don't like that question because it just thinks that like the subject line has something magical to do with it. Yes, the subject line will help them open the email. However, you know what also helps them open the email? The 50 other freaking uh, emails that were amazing that I wrote before that and that they trust me. That's why they opened my email, not because it said something cool, because if I got it from someone else, like they, it probably wouldn't have that same amount of trust, right? So that's why, like, whenever you say, like, what's the favorite subject line, uh, I, don't, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is that I delivered a lot of value on the last ones, and now they're going to open up anything I send. I send crappy subject lines usually. I, I'm just like, uh, I'll send something like if I was talking about uh, earplugs, it'll, the, the email would be called earplugs. You know? I guess like, what it, prompted this question was I was watching your video, and it was all about headlines. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you create them, you know, some, you know, what's your method, but I guess you don't have one. You're just, no, no, no. I do have a, oh. if you type in a, how to make headlines, Neville or something like that, right. you'll find, or go to copy.tv, K K O P Y dot TV. You will see one of the things called headlines and it's actually really good. What I said was go through lenses. Okay. So a lot of people like they get stuck with headlines on and, and they get way too caught up in them sometimes. Uh, and if you're writing an article, yeah, they are actually very important. However, here's what you do. Um, so you go to, and I'm going to look up the exact methods I used on this, but basically you use these lenses. Okay. Yeah. I remember it was like an inspiration. One was inspiration. One was, uh, uh, there were three of them. I'm trying to remember what I wrote about it. <laughs> so here they are. So it was competitive, benefit-driven, and inspirational. Okay, what I mean by lenses in the first place, okay? A lens is like, imagine like you got, I got these glasses and I put um, competitive glasses on. Everything's like, Ur, like aggro, yeah, like A-type personality, dudes, like big dudes, blah, blah, blah. 
So if I say improve your golf swing with the aggressive lens on, it would be like, here's how to improve your golf swing and kick your friend's ass. Here's how to uh, drive 20 yards longer than any of your friends have ever done. Like that's the aggressive side. If I was doing the golf swing through benefit driven, I would say improve your golf game by a better swing or something like that. You know, <laughs> you sound so get, professional. Twenty percent more uh, length on your on your swing by doing this one trick or something along those lines, right? That's benefit driven. Inspirational is you you can do it too. That kind of thing. So that that works very well with women often. And so the inspirational is you can have the farthest golf swing where that's sort of competitive, but you get the point. You can have the best golf swing there or improve your golf swing in 20, uh, 20 days and get be as good as Tiger Woods or something like that. You know, those are kind of the inspirational. Those are horrible examples. I wasn't on point on that one, but you get the point. So competitive, benefit driven and inspirational. So if you type in how to write headlines, Neville on Google or YouTube or go to copy.tv, you'll see the how to write headlines thing and actually give a bunch of uh, good examples with real websites. I guess like so go through the website and show each one. That one took like three days to edit, by the way. It was a pain in the ass. I like, you know, you, you pay attention to detail. I like how your, your videos kind of interject different pictures and things. But I guess, you know, I don't want to pass that up. I like how you said that's a bad question because a lot of people do ask that question. What's a better question people should be asking instead of what's your best headline or what should I think about with headlines? What's a question that that doesn't get asked that's overlooked? Well, I mean, it, it kind of, uh, I'll answer this in a roundabout way. It's yeah. kind of like give, 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 ask, right? So if you give a lot, imagine you had a friend and every, like David, and every time David calls, he's like, hey man, um, you're a chiropractor, right, Jeremy? Um, can you pop my back? Like, can you come over to my place and pop my back? And you're just like, okay, whatever, man, you'll do it the first time. And he's like, hey man, can you help me move? I just really need some help moving. Then he never calls you again for a couple months. Hey man, I hurt my back moving. Can you pop my back for free? And since we're buddies, like, can we, you know, let's just do it for free, right? So every time he calls, you you expect him to be like asking for something, and it just you go from like David, hey, to David, David, to oh my God, it's David. Like so, so that's what I think people do with a lot of their marketing. They're just like, uh, uh, bye, bye, bye. They never give anything back, like anything useful, interesting, fun, whatever. And so I think what people need to focus on is how to give so whenever they ask, people are very receptive to it, right? Whereas the person that helps you out all the time, John, John's a great guy. He's, a, he's your best friend. He's awesome. Every time something, some, you had a family problem, he was there for you. Uh, you needed a ride from the airport, he was there for you. Or he just offers to pick you up for no reason. Like, hey, man, I heard you getting back from San Francisco today. Want me to pick you up? The, the roads are bad. I'll get you. John, if he asks... Hey, um, you know, would you mind dropping this off for me? Like, I, I hurt my leg. I can't do it. You'd be like, yeah, totally, man. That's cool. Whatever. You have no qualms doing it. Business with John. How are your annoying friend David? That's what other people are like. So I think that's a better way to look at it than say just like, what's the best subject line to get these motherfuckers to open this thing? Like, that's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a scammy way of thinking, right? What's the one little short-term thing I can do? That'll get people to open an email. Yeah, they'll open the email, but if you don't have good stuff behind it and you don't consistently deliver on that, then what's the point? Like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have much of an effect. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. So, how do you yeah. decide what to deliver? Because you're saying, okay, you you give, give, give. How do you decide what to give so it's valuable to them? Okay, so there's a there's a guy named Jeff, and he has a wine company, and he consulted with me a couple times. And he, he said, basically his whole thing is kind of like they get these awesome deals on wine and they send them out. So it's like Groupon for wine or something like that. So they've got a bunch of 50,000, 100,000 something people on this email list. And, and they, all they do is just send promotions out. And they, do, they were doing okay. Like they were getting by, but it wasn't like really killing it. And he said like, dude, I don't know how many emails about wine I can write. Like what else do I write about wine? And I was like, are you crazy? There's so much stuff you can write about wine. I don't even know anything about wine, but I can find you so many emails to write about wine. And so I started making a list for him. And it's basically like the form is kind of like life plus wine, you know, your product, whatever. And so life goes through all sorts of things. So for example, what is life? Relationships. That's one of the things in life. Um, kids, family, blah, blah, blah. How do you apply those to wine? What about how, so how about every day you send an email out and you promote your stuff because people expect that. But instead of just promoting stuff and being like, buy, 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 
because you're already giving them a deal. They're getting something. They're getting a deal. But that's okay, whatever. It's just still a promotion. What if you gave them good stuff with each email? For example, how to really impress your wife tonight by a $20 a meal that'll make her feel special or something like that. And then you show uh, you can make this fish paired with this wine, which we happen to have on sale today, um, uh, and to do this and then show a picture of it spread out or something like that. And then I said, uh, well, all these, who are your customers? And they're like, they're hardcore wine fanatics. We'll be like, how to tell a cab from a Pinot or something like that. Write an email about that. And we started listing them out. How to tell a cab from a Pinot, a way to impress your date, how to throw a great dinner party, how to throw a party uh, pairing wine and cheese, the best pepperoni to, uh, uh, that goes with the cab from uh, Italy, blah, blah, blah. And I went on and on and on. And by the end, he was like, oh, my God, these are amazing. I'm like, yeah, like this, this is just stuff that a wine person would like to hear, right? This isn't like that out of the ordinary. And so he just writes – emails about that and every day these people are like wine connoisseurs already they love seeing his stuff and like his sales are shot through the roof because his his engagement is up so now they read his emails and they don't buy every time because he's giving 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 but at the end of every email there is a promotion so every single email has a promotion but he ties it in nicely with that right Mm -hmm. he doesn't say here's a california cab no if there's something interesting about that winery be like this is actually uh King Henry's wine. How is that possible? And he tells a story about it. And so then wine lovers love a story behind their wine. That's the difference between the wine. I honestly can't tell the goddamn difference between most wines. But if there's if there's something like King George drank this the night before he had his wife murdered or something like that, that's a really cool story. Or we, we once made I once uh, did an example with people that I was like, I bet I could sell a drink faster than anyone else by calling it like Al Capone's drink. And if I told a story about this was Al Capone's last drink the night he got murdered by a group of policemen trying to – whatever, something like that. If you tell a great story around it, it tastes better. It feels better. It's justifying the purchase. Yeah. And so he, he tells stories and, and they're all real, of course. You can't make this stuff up. And so he tells real stories or relates it to the product each time and now his list is like doing pretty crazy. Yeah. So yeah. what's your favorite story from someone who's written in who's used your course? Someone who's <laughs> – honestly, I like I, – there's a failure – there's a failure story. Tell me a failure someone story. Someone who tried to me and kind of dicked me over for money. <laughs> okay. They were introduced by a good friend. I just did it kind of like, okay, I'll do it. And they really like screwed me. That's like the one time I've ever really been screwed over by someone. Um, and they tried to copy the way I did their emails. They had a, a list of people that were getting emails about uh, deals at clubs in Hollywood or something like that. And some friend had invested in this, so I helped them out begrudgingly. And the email I sent out was awesome. And they got like 80% more opens and, and like tons of sales. And they were just like, dude, this is amazing. And then they're like, yeah, we're not going to pay you for this. We're just going to do it ourselves. Bye. And they tried it themselves. And what they did was they went the way, like they, they thought the reason my email did well is because it was wacky or something. They thought like, oh, it's funny and weird. So people will keep following it. So they wrote this uh, really odd email where the first five paragraphs, I still didn't know what they were selling. They were like, have you ever been typing on your Remington calculator parentheses like a hipster and blah, 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 and sipping a Shirley Temple while driving on the side of the road in an El Camino? And it was just like, they were trying to be funny like I was, but it was just like long. And, and, and I was like, what the fuck are they selling? It didn't and tie after, into the main, main thing. Sure enough, it just totally bombed, you know, and that company went out of business happily. And so, um, so that's one of my favorite stories about like the opposite of what you're supposed to do. What you learned from that story is why they sucked so much, even though their email was supposedly funny, was their email wasn't educational. My email was educational, right? So all my emails, they're not funny. That's not the point. Sometimes they happen to be funny. That's just one tool you can use for engagement. But sometimes they're very serious. But I try to make them educational. Every single time you read one of my emails, I try to have it to where you took something away from it. For example, that Kernest email I talked about earlier, that email... I told you why Steve Jobs was such an email fanatic or a font fanatic. And I told you how he used fonts and some of the background about him. You at least learned something. And there was a great quote that I I can't remember off the top of my head that he put in there. 
you learned something about that. You learned how designers use fonts to make things look good. You learned something. So every single email I did, like grasshopper.com was another email we sent out that did well. And instead of just saying like, oh, get the phone service grasshopper, I showed step by step how a small co person company like me with only a couple of people can look like a big company by having a phone system that even though it's forwards to your cell phone, it still has like a phone tree, you know, that like a big company will have and how you can use it to divide up your employees. I showed exactly how. So even if you weren't looking to buy that, you would have learned something about how to make a small company look big. Yeah. So that's the secret behind some of the emails. I like that. That was answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> now, we'll also want to know who are some of your mentors and the, their best advice for you? Because you learn from, from others, from some of the greats. Ryan, he taught me a lot. He got me into it. But he, the, the biggest thing he did was give me the, um, the, the Gary Halbert letters. So if you go to Google and type in the Gary Halbert letters, the boron letters is what it's called. The boron, B-O-R-O-N. Uh, and type in boron letters chapter ones. And wait, pause. You have to print these out. Like get a print cartridge that costs 25 bucks or something ridiculous and print them all out. So there's one through 25 chapters. If you just read them online, it's not meant to be that. These are old school marketing letters from the 80s. They have to be printed out, okay? Trust me, everyone that prints them out, they go on to do cool stuff. The people that just like, oh, skim through it online, fuck them. They, they never do anything. They, they don't commit. They're, they're not the type of people. They just want some quick information. It's not going to happen. I have all of them by my bed, uh, all 25 chapters, and I constantly read them. I take notes on them still to this day. And so the first three chapters of the, the Boron Letters by Gary Halbert, uh, all free, by the way, all free online, um, they are all about like life in general. You won't learn much about copywriting. But the next part is a lesson about business and copywriting and how he does it. But while you're reading them, take a second to like notice how he hooks you in, how he gets you to turn the page, the way he spaces his stuff, the way he centers things, the way he bolds things, why he does it, why he subliminally kind of implants certain things in you why he makes some things on a different page because you have to turn it and it's like an interaction. Notice how he gets you hooked on the letters. You don't just read the letter and stop halfway through. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, oh, it just stopped halfway through. You can't. You can't do it. And so notice all those things about it. And that is an excellent education in copy. And so that's one of the first places I start. And then Joe Sugarman's book, Advertising Secrets of the Written Word, amazing, amazing book about copy also. Yeah. Or salt stuff. So copywritingcourse.com. If you don't want to read all those letters, if you don't want to read all those books, the copywriting course, copywriting with a K and course with a K, that stuff, well, I mean, within two hours, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll know it all. And it's fun to watch. It's really cool. So what's a question, Neville, I should ask? You know, I'm interviewing a lot of legends of copywriting, the titans like yourself. What other, what's a question that I should ask them that you'd be interested in hearing? Question that they could... <laughs> you know, like I'm talking to Joe Sugarman and yeah. you as Neville be like, what, what would you want to know from, from him? What would I want to, I like hearing some of their biggest successes and why they worked so well. So Joe Sugarman would tell you about blue blockers and I've, I've been to conferences with him and I've met Joe many times and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of know the answers to all these things, mm -hmm. but it was very inspirational to hear the success stories and the kind of commonalities behind each one. Like, like for the, the blue blockers, he showed them to people and the first reaction everyone had when he showed them was, whoa, like, <clears throat> this is amazing. That's a good sign for a product, right? <clears throat> and then you hear about their failures and their failures are kind of like, it, he's trying to sell like an alarm clock with a radio in it, or sorry, sorry, like an alarm clock with a flashlight on it or something like that. It's kind of like an odd product. And people are like, oh, um, okay you know and so you see similarities in that the, the breakout products right. kind of have some momentum going already yeah or it's just very damn useful you know yeah neville i appreciate your time i have one last question uh before i ask it just tell people what you're working on now tell people a little about where they can find your copywriting course yeah, so you can type in copywriting course AppSumo if you want to buy it from AppSumo for cheaper, or you can go to copywritingcourse.com and it'll just lead you right back to AppSumo actually. Uh, so that's 69 bucks. Within two hours, you'll learn how to write higher converting copy. It's sold like, it's, it's, it's like, I don't even know how many thousands of copies by now. It's awesome. It's really, really good. It's fun. It's quick. And by the end, you can follow along and write.
if you want just the cheap checklist to go through, you can do the copywriting checklist. I have a book on Amazon. Um, so if you go to copywritingcourse.com slash book, you'll see my book. That's like five bucks or two ninety nine on Kindle. It's like a joke. I made that for fun, but it's a really good book. People love it. Uh, the other thing is I'm coming out with an autoresponder. So autoresponder course um, is something I did in the past. And it doesn't sell as well as the copywriting course. The reason is autoresponder is a much more niche thing. Like copywriting is here. Autoresponder is right here for people with businesses and websites already. So if you've already got a business that's currently running and there's no way you sign up people with, if you sign up people up for your email or you just don't have that implemented yet, that is the number one goddamn most important thing you need to do. And if you don't have that, I'm doing a class called the autoresponder class. So um, copywritingcourse.com slash ARK, autoresponder class. It's not a live uh, sales page, but that's where I'm building it right now. So you can kind of see behind the scenes if you want to. And that's going to be a little more complex. It's going to be like around $400-ish or something like that. Over four weeks, you will build an autoresponder with me. And every week we'll have live like uh, uh, Q&A and uh, office hours. Or if you have a question on what to write, I'll help you out right there. And it's totally freaking worth it because people pay me more than that per hour to consult with them for an hour. So you're getting a lot of time together with other people building autoresponders. And it's going to be a pretty – this is the first time I've done a class like this. It's going to be pretty awesome. And I guarantee you this will be the cheapest it will ever be. So if you want to do that, that's cool. Autoresponder class. Nice. Now, my last question is I know you love good stories. What are some of your favorite movies? I'm curious. Some of my favorite movies? Yeah. Um, I, like, I like Wes Anderson films and stuff like that. Like nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. I like Hindi movies because I'm Indian. Uh, I like the, the old ones. Yeah, so nothing crazy. Nothing Why crazy. Do you have, that's an odd question. I was just curious. I want. I like to bring in something from uh, your personal life that uh, you know that influences your writing, and you know you always have a funny sense of humor. I think I think Quentin Tarantino is a great director, so I like a lot of his films, like Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, um, those kinds of things. Those movies are just a Pulp Fiction. The dialogue in them is just amazing. And so I think that's an influence. And I know, uh, oh, Steven Spielberg. I like watching um, Steven Spielberg films are always amazing, right? And one of the things, if you look up, uh, like, inside the actor studio, Steven Spielberg, look that up on Google. And there's an interview with him. And he talks about how storytelling, it all starts with story. Before they film a thing, before they draw a thing, it's a story behind it. A really good, good, good story. And behind every good, really good movie, there's just a great story. I saw the play Wicked, you know, the Wizard of Oz mm-hmm, play? Yeah. Buying a ticket and going with a friend, and it was just like, ah, it's going to be the Wizard of Oz musical form. Man, the storyline behind that play was unbelievable. Uh, the, way they, the way they spun everything around from what I thought it was going to be was so unpredictable. I would, and the way it all tied in together, I was like, that is one goddamn good piece of storytelling mixed in with a pretty good play, which made it amazing. Yeah. And so, and so behind any good production, there's a good story. Yeah. And that's what I find with a lot of your writing and a lot of your videos. There's always a good story. You tie in a good story into it. So, you know, Neville, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been valuable. I appreciate it. Will you virtually pop my back, you know, as a chiropractor? There. There. You're, you're healed. (laughs) Here. I'm going to try to, is this, is like, let's see. You'll have to uh, come to Chicago for that. I popped that. I don't know if you could hear it. I couldn't, he- couldn't hear it on the mic. <laughs> there you go. Right, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Neville.